I'm excited to be here and moderating this important and timely conversation on what the future holds for nuclear power. As many of you know, we had Peter Schwartz and Ralph Cavana scheduled last year's summit uh, to come out and do this debate. Uh, unfortunately, because of the weather, we had to reschedule, and I'm really thankful to both of you for agreeing to make it happen this year. So thank you very much. A as quick background, this is actually not the first time that Ralph and Peter have met to discuss this topic. It was five years ago in January of 2006 that Ralph and Peter held a similar forum at the Herbst Theater in San Francisco. Both men are passionate and keen observers and uniquely qualified for this point-counterpoint conversation on nuclear power. It won't be a traditional debate, but it'll definitely have aspects of a point-counterpoint conversation. Um, on the pro side, we have Peter Schwartz. And to those of you who know Peter, he's the co-founder and chairman of Global Business Network, now I believe the largest division within the Monitor Group companies. They do scenario planning for a host of clients, including corporations, governments, the US military and nonprofits, including groups like Google.org. Peter wrote the seminal book on scenario planning, The Art of the Long View. And if you've not read that, I recommend getting it. It's a very uh, cogent uh, discussion even now, many years after its initial release. And he spent five years at Royal Dutch Shell heading up their scenario planning efforts. On the con side, we have Ralph Cavana. Ralph, who is quoted as saying he has the best job in the environmental sector, I believe I've heard that before, is co-director of the energy program at Natural Resources Defense Council. He's also served as a member of the US Secretary of Energy's Advisory Board and has been a visiting professor of law at both Stanford and UC Berkeley. He has been a scholar of and leading champion for renewables and energy efficiency. So welcome to both of you. Um, here's how today's debate style format's gonna work. Uh, Peter's gonna go first. He's gonna take up to 10 minutes to make the pro case for nuclear power. Um, his remarks will be followed by Ralph, who will also take up to 10 minutes to do the con side. Um, and then we'll jump into a moderated conversation up here. I'll then open it up to Q&A from the audience, and then we'll give them each one minute for closing remarks. So with that, I'd like to bring Peter up and we'll get going. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. And, and uh, for both of us, for Ralph and me, let me apologize for last year. Uh, we got trapped by the weather and we're uh, delighted that the organizers uh, have given us another opportunity to go at each other. Uh, Ralph uh, is, of course, an old friend uh, and a very few of us have done as much for the environment uh, as Ralph Cavana has. But with having said that, let me begin. Ralph, you ignorant slut. <laughs> the argument is actually a very straightforward and very simple one. And it really begins with one very large fact, and it's the fact of climate change. And it's the fact that climate change is not a distant prospect that we should be worried about in 50 or 100 or 200 years, but it's a reality of today. Uh, when we think about risks, you should talk to the people of Pakistan or the citizens of Australia or the citizens of Moscow uh, who all suffered the ravages of climate change in the last year. Thousands of people died this last year because the climate is changing. How many people died in nuclear accidents last year or the year before or the year before or the year before? Every year from now on, people will be dying because of climate change. That's the reality. It is not a distant prospect of gradual global warming, but an increasing frequency of extreme weather events of the sort that we've had in the last year. That is the climate that we are moving into, a world of increasing disruption of human life, of agriculture, and of ecosystems around the world. These weather extremes are the indicator of what is to come. But it will be worse because, of course, today only about 2 billion people in the world are living at a standard of living roughly comparable to what we all enjoy. In the next 20, 30, 40 years, another 4 billion people will want to enjoy the lifestyle that we're enjoying. If they all try to live as we do today, if they all drive that lovely Tesla out there and add to the electricity demand of the world, moving it from gasoline and oil to electricity, we're going to find that literally those four billion people are going to add an enormous amount to the electricity demand of the world. 
And if we are not to deny them the opportunity that we've all enjoyed, and let me say, I think equity and morality demands that we allow them to, that we don't have the option of saying, no, the gate's closed, we got there, but you don't. Uh, you don't get to play the way we do. There's something fundamentally immoral about that. And oh, by the way, they ain't going to accept it. They aren't going to accept that. They're going to get rich, and they're going to drive cars, and they're going to have homes, and they're going to fly in airplanes. Anybody who's been to China or India lately knows what I'm talking about. There's a ferocity of growth in those places, a ferocity of demand, an energy that is driving those societies that is simply astonishing and will not be stopped no matter what. And energy fuels all of that. And the issue here is one fundamental fact, that the energy that is driving that today is more and more coal, more and more coal. And if we move toward electric vehicles and away from oil and uh, oil powered vehicles, we're going to see even more demand for coal. So it's really all about the coal. And Ralph's colleague Dave Hawkins calculated that if China, India, and the United States go ahead with all the coal plants we are now planning to build over the next 25 to 30 years, we will put into the atmosphere as much CO2 from those three countries as the entire world has done since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. That's what we're talking about. And I will tell you, every nuclear plant that does not get built is a coal plant that will be built. Uh, and once you build those coal plants, they're not going to get shut down. They're going to be around for decades and decades to come. And the sooner we build them, the less likely it is that they will have any form of carbon capture or sequestration associated with it. So we will find that more and more and more of the plants here in China and in India and elsewhere around the world, but those three are the big ones, uh, will be built with relatively dirty coal, putting out an enormous amount of CO2. That's the core issue. And as much as I love solar, and as much as I think wind turbines are really cool, I'm, I'm an aeronautical engineer, I'm literally a rocket scientist by education, I think wind turbines are really cool. Having said that, they will not substitute for the coal. We will not close down coal plants to replace them with wind turbines and solar. Uh, for all the obvious reasons which I don't need to go into. And so those 400 million pe four, uh, 4 billion people wanting to get rich, if they all do it with coal, will lead a terrible situation to becoming truly catastrophic. In this week's issue of Science Magazine, for example, there's an article of, about a new piece of research that just came out of NCAR that suggests that if we continue on the path that we are on, we are headed toward not 450 or 550 parts per million of CO2, but in the direction of 1,000. And the momentum of this system worldwide is enormous. And if we get up to those kinds of numbers, what we're looking at is a 31 degree increase centigrade in the average temperature of the Earth, 31 degrees C. That is not survivable for our civilization. That is what is at stake in the end in this choice. If we continue down the road toward more coal to fuel the wealth of the four billion, we are literally going to destroy the planet. We're going to destroy the habitability of the entire Earth. Human civilization will not survive that error. That is the risk of saying no to nuclear power today. Nuclear power has risks, there's no doubt about it. Every technology has risks. But what we have seen in the last decade is that, in fact, the options for nuclear power have grown. We have a variety of new technologies uh, that have come along in the last decade or so. Now, the truth is that we in the United States adopted the nuclear power early on with relatively poor technological choices. Over time, the technology options have increased. There are better choices being pursued elsewhere in the world today. We have not started a nuclear plant in the last 30 years, and as a result, our technology is pretty well out of date. But having said that, what we can already see, if you look in Wikipedia, just to take an example, and some of you can probably do that sitting at your laptops, and if you look under micronuclear reactors, you'll find 12 different designs. That is, these are nuclear reactors that range from about 250 megawatts all the way down to 10 megawatts. Uh, small scale, modular plants, some of which can be built in factories, trucked to sites, some of which are already being built that way. The Russians are building 35 megawatt reactors, putting them on barges and taking them up to the Arctic even as we speak. The the country of Singapore is considering building an island and, put, and put, putting a small-scale reactor offshore. So what we're looking at around the world is an interest in nuclear reactors of all scales, not just simply the mega scales that we've been used to in the past. For example, at Lawrence Livermore Lab, the Hyperion reactor is a 10 megawatt reactor about the size of a refrigerator. Uh, when you're done with it, you bury it and cover it up and forget it. 
Uh, now, my point is very simple, that the options are increasing because the demand is increasing. We need the options, and we now have about a dozen different runners in microreactors beginning to come along. At the high end, we've got two or three other designs, the AP1000 and several others that are beginning to be developed. The point is that as a result, what we've got is a variety of choices. We're not locked into one single nuclear technology. We have competing, competing technologies that all offer options. We in the United States, unfortunately, are not moving very aggressively aggressively as the rest of the world is. The one other option I might mention, which is a surprise and I would not have included in the past, but I think is now increasingly plausible, is new fusion technology. Now, many of you will be familiar with the, uh, the magnetic bottle that is being built in Europe. I think it's unlikely to work. I think the physics of it doesn't work. But at Le Livermore Labs, we've got the giant new National Ignition Facility, which is a giant laser, actually about 128 lasers coming in on a beam and uh, uh, producing fusion in a small deuterium capsule. They expect to ha hit sustained fusion next year. Uh, if they succeed, they think they will have a commercial reactor in 10 years, i.e. 2020. Now, let me say that the odds of success here, let me call it 1 in 10. It's still pretty low. The engineering of this is unbelievably difficult. But having said that, if it happens, it's a real breakthrough and it's a game-changing technology. Deuterium is abundant and relatively cheap and can produce abundant electricity using laser fusion. I'm not counting on that. What I am saying is that we need to pursue all of those options. All of them need to be pursued because we don't have any luxury, we don't have any time to waste, we don't have any maneuvering room, and we cannot achieve the levels of CO2 reduction necessary to slow the climate change that is already underway. Because the climate change is happening, it isn't a question of weather, it's only a question of how much. And if we go ahead without nuclear power, if you look at the way in which the renewables are being deployed today and being operated today, and even in any system that one can imagine in the near future, it is unlikely to be able to produce the volume of electricity that we are going to need in addition to what is coming with the growth in population and the growth in demand from things like electric vehicles. So unless we are prepared to see the kind of weather events that we've seen in the last year continue and to increase in their intensity, increase in their frequency, and increase in their impacts around the world, causing vast human suffering, starvation, and death in enormous numbers, we need nuclear power. Thank you. When Peter Schwartz began his remarks in a jocular way by saying, Ralph, you ignorant slut, he was invoking a line, as some of you may recall, the older folks in the room, that was first actually uttered uh, by Chevy Chase about Jane Curtin in a Saturday Night Live episode that aired in 1976. Now, that was a long time ago, but it was substantially more recent than the last successful nuclear power plant order in the United States. <laughs> and in thinking about, first, let's be clear about one thing. Uh, Peter Schwartz is the most compelling single proponent of nuclear power in the entire universe. And I thought he made a valiant effort today. <laughs> and this will be one of the few occasions when I am going to follow someone who speaks even faster than I do. But this is a room full of people who are used to fast-talking salesmen who arrive with the best technology on Earth. And only if you will only come up with a few more, in his case, hundreds of billions of dollars he will solve the world's economic and environmental problems with it. What everyone in this room, I think, knows is that the world of clean technology procurement doesn't work quite that way at this scale. And that's the most important thing I'm going to have to tell you about, in addition to six words with which I will close my presentation that represent the strongest possible rebuttal of what Peter has told you from someone other than me, whose identity I think will interest you. But I want to say a couple of things, first of all, about Peter himself. Uh, Peter and I, uh, as uh, Ron mentioned last, had this debate five years ago at the Herbst Theater in uh, San Francisco, and the moderator was uh, Stuart Brand, who many in this room revere along with me. And afterwards, Stuart wrote a book in which he basically adopted Peter's position completely in every respect. And I read through it and was slightly crushed. 
<laughs> but there was one passage that I want to read to you that expresses something important that I want to say about the disagreement Peter and I are having, and it's a dis disagreement in this room, I, I suspect, although clearly Peter's got uh, the majority on his side at the moment. What Stewart did was he said, you know, the, in the world of people who care about clean technology and environment, there are now two camps and soon maybe more camps. He called one the greens and one the turquoises. Uh, I'm a green and Peter is suggested by his choice of shirt today is a turquoise. But here's what, here's what Stewart said about that. He said, you know, the greens and the turquoises, they're gonna differ over nuclear power. They can divide up what there is to be done outside of nuclear power and they can still be overworked and overwhelmed. If they maintain an ongoing mutually respectful debate, that will help each camp critique the other's projects usefully and they'll also know when to collaborate for focused effectiveness. If they define themselves in partisan opposition to each other, then all is lost. And I think Stewart is absolutely right about that. And I'm not going to spend a few minutes critiquing one of uh, my friend Peter's projects, but also suggesting some areas for focused collaboration. Now, on the issue of why I still respectfully differ with Peter, who has come to you preaching basically the gospel of nuclear renaissance, uh, he and I have been at this for a long time. I started shortly after Chevy Chase said that about Jane Curtin. And over the 31 years that I've been doing this, I, I believe I've lived through at least five nuclear renaissances. Moments at which exciting new nuclear technologies had us poised on the verge of a brave new era. And I actually co-authored one of the reports about what was needed to make the nuclear renaissance work. This, this thing I'm holding in my hand, was it started out at the very end of the Reagan administration. And we were commissioned, there was a, a group of us commissioned by the National Academy of Sciences to define what it would take to launch the next nuclear renaissance. Now the committee was 18 nuclear fanatics and me. Uh, the 18 nuclear fanatics were not nearly as compelling in public as Peter, but he would readily acknowledge that each and every one of them was as passionately committed as he. And I went along for the ride because I thought it would be interesting to define a world in which nuclear power could succeed. We basically told the nuclear industry they needed to do three big things. Uh, and I didn't think any of the three were possible. In fact, the nuclear industry pulled off two of the three. The first was you've got to, this is 20 years ago, remember, this is, when, this is when these recommendations came out, 20 years ago. We said, first, you've got to dramatically improve your safety and operational culture. At the time, the average nuclear plant was running at a capacity factor of about 60%. There was a lot of sloppiness. There were terrible relationships with the safety regulators. The nuclear industry cleaned up its act. You need to hear me say that. They got the capacity factors over 90%, safety culture dramatically better, internal controls that are now being used as the model for what the offshore oil industry needs to do to clean up its act. And I'm glad to see that. We also told them they had a tremendous amount to do to shore up their legislative and regulatory position. They created the most effective lobbying entity in all of Washington. If we could do what they did, we being the efficiency and renewable side, then all of Dan Riker's aspirations from this morning would have been reached already. They got a, a, a wonderful thicket of operating subsidies, construction subsidies, subsidies for possible delays in regulatory uh, action. They got, they got immunity from uh, catastrophic accidents. They got a much more uh, effective relationship with their regulators. They did all of that. But we told them there was one other thing they had to do. That in a utility industry, increasingly marked by a competitive procurement model where the old monopolies were falling away, the old monopolies that had nurtured the first generation of nuclear plants had still generated costly cancellations, we told them they had to, to create a competitive product for that new competitive procurement system that we predicted would come to dominate the US utility industry and ultimately the world industry. And I think we were right about that and that is where the signal failure has been and remains. Again, in the 20 years since, how many nuclear plants successfully moved through competitive procurement? None. When was the last nuclear plant actually ordered and built? 1973. In a commentary from late 2010, called Honey, I Shrunk the Renaissance, regulator Peter Bradford, who knows as much about nuclear energy as anyone on Earth, looked at the competitive performance of nuclear power, uh, pointed out that as far as he could tell, in relative terms, with all of the competitors capable of meeting the economic and environmental challenges that Peter and I care passionately about, and I will yield nothing to him in how much I care about uh, global climate and the urgency of suspending this uniquely dangerous experiment we're all conducting with it. And if the choice really were coal versus nuclear, I'd be there with Peter. 
but everyone in this room knows there are many other choices. What Bradford said in thinking about the competitive procurement world of utilities and where nuclear fit, the analogy he used that I thought was in some ways apt was he said, you know, the urgency of world hunger does not compel us to fight back with caviar, no matter how nourishing fish eggs may be. And what's imperfect about the analogy is that caviar, at least, can be acquired relatively quickly and served in small doses. The fundamental problem with the nuclear reactors now on the market and being offered in competitive procurement is precisely that they are so big, that they, say they take so long to build, that they are so relatively inflexible in operation. They are designed as giant 24-7 city-sized power supplies, remote from population centers, the antithesis of everything you've been told today about what we're trying to accomplish with the smart grid. And yet, and yet what is most important to know is Peter has confidence about the prospects of nuclear in a world of competitive procurement. I have no confidence. Neither of us is going to be the decision maker. The decision makers will be the utilities that collectively across North America and the world are the most important investors in clean technology, as everyone here knows. The issue is, can nuclear make its case against the most formidable competition we've ever seen? And this is, in many ways, I think, a good news story. Not just, I don't think Peter and I can begin in the short time we have available to do justice to all the competitors, but they come in and present to all of you all the time. You know how rich the efficiency, renewables, efficient natural gas, and a whole host of other options really are. All the integration solutions to make sure that the intermittent resources can meld with the others. The very concept of baseload generation, which drives much of the nuclear enthusiasm, is almost certainly obsolete today, as Peter might agree, and even more important, the chair of the current Federal Energy Regulatory Commission agrees. But where we can agree, and this is the note on which I want to close, is that we all, wherever our relative level of enthusiasm is for nuclear power, we need a functioning system of long-term resource procurement. We need the utilities and power to go out and invest, make long-term decisions. I'm with Peter. I want them to be able to make 10, 20-year commitments to the best options available that come through competitive procurement. I don't want the world energy markets to run solely on spot markets. And that model of long-term utility procurement is very much under challenge today in the United United States and worldwide. We need today to shore it up together. We need to be before those public utility commissions, which are in unlovely places, remote places across the United States and North America, making the case for more clean technology investment and ensuring that it does not shut down. As we make that case, my fundamental reason for optimism that other, better alternatives will prevail is summed up in the six words that I promised to provide, which were reported in the New York Times at a conference convened in December 2010 by the Idaho National Engineering Lab, which has the strongest rooting interest in nuclear power imaginable. The quote is from the chief nuclear officer of the Exelon Corporation, who runs the biggest nuclear fleet in North America and does it better than anyone else on Earth. And on the prospects for new nuclear plants to be ordered by Exelon through competitive procurement, he said this, we just can't make the numbers work. Thank you. So, Peter, I'd like to direct the first question to you. He talked about utility as a decision maker. And as we know, it, it costs around, conservatively, 3 to $7 billion per gigawatt installed today for nuclear. Uh, those are relatively conservative numbers. Some go higher to $10 billion a gigawatt. Or 19. Or 19. Um, and we did some research that showed a huge range, and, and, and others have done it as well. Um, so my question is this. Um, with this competitive procurement framework and the signal failure that he talked about, what is the economic case that you can make for nuclear power? Well, look, first of all, we have to recognize that the system that has evolved out of electricity deregulation and competitive procurement isn't working all that well. And we can expect a fair amount of change in that as we move forward. But having said that, I think the, the, the issue is that the old model that Ralph was alert, uh, uh, alluding to of mega plants and decisions that were multi-billion dollar decisions that were huge financial risks are not the only options in front of us. Fortunately, I think we've bought a bit of time. That is, I think natural gas is actually preventing some of the coal from being built that would otherwise have been built. So the fact that we've discovered abundant shale gas has actually given us a bit more time. Uh, I'm in complete agreement with Ralph that efficiency is actually our first choice, and we can probably, if we're aggressive about that, achieve as much as 50% gain. So I'm prepared to knock out 50% of the increase in demand with efficiency, and I, and I think we would agree on that. 
The interesting question, therefore, if we have a bit of time, is is the technology of nuclear going to evolve to reduce both the technical economic risks as well as the issue of the decision risk, i.e., do I have to make a mega decision or can I make a modest incremental decision? And I think the, the reality is that we, in many instances in the United States, we can make incremental decisions. We don't have to make the mega thousand megawatt decision of the old power plant design. And I think that's the thrust of the new design reactors, many of which are much, much smaller scale. Having said that, there are going to be places in time where we are going to want to build big plants, i.e. replacing some of the existing ones because they are aging and replacing some of the large coal plants that are, going, that are not going to be replaced otherwise by renewables. So, so uh, if we think in particular about some of the coal uh, states in the United States, they're not going to back off rather quickly from the coal that they already have. So the question is, can we offer another option? And we see that developing in the South where, in fact, the transmission facilities are already in place. And I think the, the point that Ralph made about transmission being an important issue is real. But having said that, that is also real for renewables, i.e., yes, we would love to have nice distributed renewables, but we're also getting very large-scale central. And we've seen, not far from here, opposition to the power line to bring solar from the desert to San Diego. Uh, so nuclear, has, I mean, uh, renewables has its own issues in that respect. So I, I, I think we have to take the transmission issues off the table in that respect. Respect. And when we do that, then the economics begins to make sense. Not at the moment, because I don't think we need the nuclear plants today in the United States. But in the very near future, we're going to. So you're definitely proposing waiting for next generation nuclear reactors and more modular, scalable That's right. technology. So, so Ralph, just on that point, I was interesting what you just said, uh, Peter, in terms of natural gas almost as a bridge for the future nuclear technologies. Uh, Ralph, what's your take on that? Because I think the conversation that was happening earlier today is natural gas as a bridge to renewables and efficiency and, and smart grid. Well, if you are, take this in two parts. There's first of all the question of what's the system of competitive procurement going to look like, and where I, I want to differ with, I don't, there's not a monolithic utility model in the United States. There's a very interesting range, and I think we have a rooting interest, so let me declare it. I think what we don't want is what I will call the extreme California model of the mid-90s, which basically said we're going to run the world on energy spot markets, we're going to take the utilities out of the procurement business, and if somebody wants to build a nuclear plant, they can make the sale to individual residential retail customers. And I, I heard that and asked incredulously, you know, what on earth would be in this say for my mother? And the response from the advocate of this brave new world of electricity deregulation was, for the first time in history, she can hedge her own fuel price risks in the marketplace. <laughs> and many of you heard that argument, and some of you may have been persuaded by it, but it didn't work. We need institutions that can do long-term procurement, that can aggregate all of us, uh, and make choices on our behalf, and build a portfolio that includes both long-term and short-term commitments. I think we have a rooting interest in that model, and then empowering the utilities to do it. And interestingly enough, the state that best captures that today, so it's not the old monopolies. What the utility is doing is competitive procurement. Other people are offering the options. People in this room hopefully will be investing in them. What the utility is doing is making investment decisions and assembling and orchestrating a portfolio over a complex electricity system. We all want that model to prevail. We don't want to stay stuck in the spot market world where people are trying to market to individual residential customers. And not, neither nuclear nor I think anything else that surfaced today as a promising long-term option can win there. But the most important thing for me to say is Peter and I won't get to decide this. What I want is a system that lets the winners and losers emerge on the, on the merits. I think competitive procurement is the right way to go. There's another alternative, by the way, which is dictate the choices from the central government. Have some combination of John Boehner and Kathy Zoe decide <laughs> what the future energy portfolio of the U.S. is. And if you laugh at that, that's how they do it in China, fundamentally. These are central government decisions. That's how they do it in France. That's how they do it in Russia. I don't think that's how we should do it. So, so Ralph, this is a great point. I want to get to this and have you both chime in on this. Um, I think you made a strong case, perhaps, for the issues of nuclear power in the United States. And I thought that Peter made a very strong point about the challenges of China, Russia, India, and other nations, and perhaps how would they meet their climate targets? How would they meet their global energy needs without nuclear? So could you address that a bit? Do you see a future for those countries without nuclear, and how would they do that? Well, and, and again, here, uh, something on which Peter and I are in fundamental agreement, we think that the world faces hard carbon constraints and hard environmental constraints, and then the issue is how to meet them. What Peter is willing to say is, I know for certain 
that nuclear has to be a central part of the solution. I have less technology hubris on this than Peter does. What I want is a system that lets the winners and losers again emerge on the merits. If Peter is right, I mean, people say to me, is nuclear power back on the table? It's never been off the table, in my mind, in the United States or anywhere else, in all the years that I've been doing this. In the United States, where we run competitive procurement as the central focus, it hasn't won any contracts yet. In China, which doesn't use competitive procurement, there are 24 nuclear plants under construction at this moment, which maybe Peter views positively. What worries me is I remember what happened when Washington State, through a public agency, tried to build five nuclear plants at once back in the late 70s and early 80s. The acronym WHOOPS still has some currency in Washington State. That was the Washington Public Power Supply System. And the notion of building 24 nuclear plants at once with a country that has relatively little nuclear experience and an undeveloped nuclear infrastructure makes me plenty nervous. And, and with more in the planning, what do you well, think of that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I haven't just been to China not long ago and ridden on their high-speed rail system, um, which they have offered to build one for us here in California. Um, and, and we might take them up on it. It's the only way we're going to get a high-speed rail. They think they can actually make money on it here in California. And that high-speed rail is, of course, powered by electricity. And they are transforming their economy rather dramatically. They've got 2,500 miles of high-speed rail. And why, that's one of the reasons they think they need nuclear power. And I also just returned from India. And you watch what's happening in even rural India by way of economic growth. And you see the 800 million people living in desperate poverty in India. And you say to them, no, actually, you can't have nuclear power that will be relatively cheap. Oh, you should burn coal instead, because that's the alternative they're actually looking at. They're going to do as much uh, solar and wind as they can, as their climate allows. And their climate has issues with respect to solar. It depends where in India you are and what you can do. So, in my view, I don't think they have a choice. And, but I want to go back one, to one thing you said a, a moment and ago. And I think they do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, <clears throat> in terms of that central procurement, we had a very interesting election recently in, in California about uh, uh, municipalization. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the election was not a statewide election, it was, the count, it was Marin. And Marin elected because they wanted green energy to be able to buy their own electricity and get away from that evil giant PG&E of central procurement. Who did they contract with to buy their electricity from? I believe it was the Shell Oil Company. It was Shell Oil, exactly. <laughs> that small local company from California. Um, uh, John's old company, my old company. Right. <clears throat> the artifacts of ownership, acquisition, operation, and so on are important questions. But in the end, it is how much emission comes out of the power plant that is really going to be the issue. And now, Marin cannot be at all certain what the outcome will be by way of reduced emissions by the choices they made locally to get clean energy. They may get natural gas, they may get solar, they may get wind, they may get hydro, depending upon what Shell is able to purchase in their behalf. So I think these are largely artifacts, and in the end we have to look at what the actual outcome is in terms of power plants that get built and the emissions that result from it, and the lifetimes of those plants. Because, of course, we're talking about things that last many decades. We're running coal plants that are, in many instances, decades old and incredibly dirty, and we ought to be replacing those as well. But I think the, the, uh, the reason for some humility in all of this is nicely captured by where the energy debate was back when Peter was listening first to Saturday Night Live. Because in the late 70s, the article of faith in the United States was that the choice was coal and nuclear. Mm -hmm. Peter remembers this. And, that the, and indeed, for many, it was not a choice, but we needed as much of both as we could possibly get, or the light simply would not stay on. If you look at the history of the last 30 years in the United States, it was largely about alternatives. And efficiency. And efficiency, first and foremost. And efficiency yes. was, of course, the most important. And Peter and I agree on that. And I offer this as simply th those who have claimed a world of binary choices in energy policy in our own country uh, in past years have, I think, uh, been proven. And, and, th and it's a wholly positive story, because w what proved it to be wrong was not that obstructionists blocked the urgently needed coal and nuclear plants. It was the evolution. In, in, in the age of dinosaurs, of the nimbler uh, mammals, the lower cost alternatives that for, I think, most people look very much more compelling. And all I ask Peter to acknowledge, and I know he will do this because he's a reasonable man, <laughs> uh, is the possibility that there might be innovation in other sectors, every bit as exciting and every bit as compelling as what he 
foresees now for nuclear, so, which I'll just point out, we foresaw also in 1990, which hasn't showed up quite yet. So, so Ralph, I'd like to go into that for a second. Sure. So I think one of your arguments would be for baseload power, we need nuclear. And I'd like you to just paint a picture in a minute or so, because we're so limited on time, sort of addressing what are some of the other options that you see and why do you believe we can do it with, without nuclear? But the most baseload. important thing, for, for baseload power, what are we, this is an audience that knows well that that question is 10 years out of date. I mean, what John Wellinghoff is the chair of FERC said in a recent speech and was absolutely right about it, I think is the term baseload is now obsolete. That what we, we are in a world with smart grids, with intermittent renewables, with a whole host of new integration technologies, we do not need something that runs 24-7. I think you and Amory would say that, and others, and I might as well, but I don't think everyone says that, so I, I'd love well, to go a little I, further I'm, on this. I'm here to try to make sure yeah. that as many yes. more people as possible end up saying it, because I believe it strongly, and the notion that there's some arbitrary category called baseload, we've got to eat our vegetables before we can get to dessert. My, if you, when you saw the panel this morning on natural gas and renewables, when Riker and his colleagues were talking about what the integration solutions are that marry the best of both, into a reliable 24-7 power supply, you were getting at the heart of why Wellinghoff says that the term base load is now obsolete. And I think that's right. And I'll be surprised if Peter strongly disagrees I with think it. I disagree do so disagree. Well, all right. uh, see, I, I'm not sure we're there yet, Ralph. I'm not sure. We, we may be there someday. And someday maybe only well, a few years. We have old. a little time now. Yeah, well, we, it may be, but the deployment of, I, I'm all in favor of smart grid. I'm in favor of smart everything. I mean, we, we don't want anything that's stupid. Having said that, <laughs> uh, the, the, the point is that uh, actually implementing a smart grid is a really big challenge. It's not a little thing. It's an economic challenge. It's a technical challenge. It's a behavioral challenge. I mean, we saw the, the, the things that people will do with a smart grid. You know, I don't think most people are really all that hungry to manage their electricity day to day, minute by minute, hour by hour. There are a few of us are, and there are some who are economically driven to do so. But the truth is that most people just want to turn on the lights or to open the refrigerator and have things work. Uh, and the truth is that the smart grid is, I think, going to have a very big effect on people and institutions and organizations that are very sensitive to the economics of energy. Most of us are not that sensitive to the economics of energy. And so I think that the reality of the smart grid providing an alternative mechanism for integration is still quite a long way off before we reach the scale that would be required to minimize the need for baseload. We will need transmission capacity that is much, much greater than we have today, oh, if that's ever going to no, happen. We, we agree, even, even if one assumes that I'm right and that baseload is an obsolete term, there are still going to need to be, for instance, remote renewables developed here. Yeah. So we're not in disagreement on that. And I don't think, I don't conflate the smart grid with all of the elements of the integration solutions that, for example, the natural gas panel was talking about that. A lot of that's just smart utility management. But look, but look the, the guys uh, from Google who just, announced that they're going to put in the transmission, underwater transmission facilities sure. for linking wind power, offshore wind power on the East Coast. Really cool idea, okay? Immediately about five governors of the states between the upper Midwest and the East Coast said, well, wait a minute, we want to make sure you don't expect us to build transmission lines across uh. our states to be able to deliver wind power from the Midwest to the East Coast or other areas. But Peter, you and I have a, that problem's gonna have to be solved whether it's a nuclear future or a non-nuclear future. Well, that I can is build your... a nuclear plant in South Carolina and I may not be able to but, run the power line all the way from Wisconsin uh, or North Dakota I, to bring me power. Well, but if, Peter, if you're willing to give up, if you're willing to re rededicate the existing big sites, we can do lots of things with them. Well, we can expand the existing sites. Yeah. We've got 102 sites where we could already build additional plants that exist today. And we can actually put other facilities on those sites. The largest uh, solar development in Washington state is, of course, on the abandoned nuclear Well, we should cover the, the everything Public around the plants with, nu with solar. I have no problem with that. Okay, so solar and nuclear are together. Yes. Uh, so. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm <laughs> suggesting that sometimes one is a useful alternative, and there were 15,000 megawatts. Happen, and I've seen Peter that, of was course, stunned, of I think, to find that 15,000 megawatts of PV went in worldwide this year. That's true. After 250. 50, 10 years ago, it's a pretty rapid growth rate. Yeah. Of course, solar power is a form of nuclear. So, so let's go on to the waste issue. Well, if he's willing to accept that, <laughs> I'll uh, the debate. So, on so, to the waste issue. Uh, so, so let's go to waste because the, the industry has had decades to, to solve that issue. They haven't. That's one of my big complaints. It's why I don't put it in a clean tech taxonomy yet. So can you talk about some of the technologies you see coming out? And then, Ralph, I'd like your comments on that. Sure. Uh, I, I am not one of the people who favors Yucca Mountain, for example. I've actually been down in the hole. I went all the way down into the hole. It's a really cool hole. It ain't ever going to 
have nuclear waste in it. Uh, and because it's a bad idea. I mean, first of all, the idea of storing things for tens of thousands of years or literally millions of years, I think, is a non-starter. Uh, I don't think we can ever count on that. Having said that, the actual thing we are doing today is probably not a very bad idea. That is local storage in pools, in concrete caskets that are relatively safe. And is that probably not a bad idea? Because I think we're going to want that fuel later on. That is that that waste we're going to want to do things with when our technology for reprocessing waste gets better. It will be more accessible in its current form. And it's, you know, we're only using about 6% of the energy out of the fuel right now. We could get much more out of that energy. So my theory of the waste is don't bury it forever. Now, there is probably some very high-level waste, mostly associated with nuclear weapons, not with nuclear power, that we probably do need to bury forever. The Canadians are digging a very deep hole to go down to close to the mantle uh, and actually, you know, uh, dump it many miles down. That may be the answer, a real shield. Uh, but have for, uh, for weapons waste. But for nuclear power waste, I think we need to keep it around and relatively accessible and, for a long time. And but, any technologies that you see on the forefront to encapsulate it better and, and handle it? Actually, the stuff we're using right now is not bad for a couple hundred years. Okay, That's about what we need to improve our reprocessing and make sure we still have that fuel available. This is not the technology for 10,000 years, but for a couple hundred, it'll work. Here is the difficulty, though. If you are a utility executive and you're thinking about resource procurement, involving a nuclear plant competitor. Peter just told you something really important, which is that you are going to remain responsible for that waste on True. your site for a couple million, couple hundred no, years. I, yeah. Couple hundred <laughs> years. A couple hundred years is still well outside the comfortable time frame of the typical utility CEO. That's a problem. The fact that you are going to have to take that responsibility, the fact that that is one of the legacy burdens that comes with that choice, is part of why the Exelon chief nuclear officer can't make the numbers work anymore. Okay. So there are more than two dozen states with RPS. Only one of them includes nuclear power. There are debates raging right now inside Capitol Hill to have a clean energy standard, which could include nuclear. Uh, there's also questions around CETA, the Green Bank. Uh, if that moves forward, should it include nuclear or not? So those are two, a two-point question. But uh, Ralph, maybe you could start. Should we include this? Should we not? And, and well, it, I, if, in order for the Congress to pass a low carbon energy standard, a minimum procurement requirement for utilities that some part of the inventory be low carbon, I think nuclear will have to be included. So if you want to see something get enacted, it's going to have to be there. What I would say, if I were offered that proposition, full, comp full competitive opportunity for efficiency renewables head to head against nuclear, and it was truly a full competitive opportunity, I'd say go for it and I'd say we'd sweep the table. Now, on the issue of the Clean Energy Development Bank, I reach a different conclusion because the nuclear guys already have everything that's in the Clean Energy Development Bank for efficiency and renewables. They've got the production incentives. They've got the upfront investment credits. They've got insurance against regulatory delays. They've got absolute liability pretty close for accidents. What on earth more could the federal government devise to make life hospitable for a nuclear plant? And it just seems to me that at that point, you're, it's, it's rather ridiculous to layer that on as well. But I actually happen to agree with Ralph on this one, and, and mainly because I think, in fact, renewables need that extra boost. I mean, I think we're going to need, uh, I, I do think we need as much solar and as much wind as we can get. Having said that, I think this is one of the best ways to get it, and I think it would be a distraction, to both improve. politically and economically and from a resource point of view, to take the, this new development bank and, uh, and focus it, it on nuclear. Great, great, great. Ralph, we're going to have to wrap up now, so since Peter went first, I'd like you to go first now in your one-minute summary on your argument. Peter has erected a world in which, as he said, every dollar I don't spend on a nuclear plant will go to a coal plant. And if you think that's the world, you vote with Peter. But nobody in this room can possibly think that's the world. You know two things. You know that there is a limited amount of capital available to solve our energy and climate problems, and that there is an urgent need to pick a portfolio in which the winners and losers emerge on the merits in terms of cost, scale, and risk. And it's going to be diverse, and it is going to draw on all the genius and innovation represented in this room. And Peter's bringing you the same old stuff we saw in 1990, and it really had its origins in the monopoly world of the 50s and 60s. We can do better. Great. Okay. Thank you. And Peter. Ralph, you know, look, I think this is, in the end, a question of moral judgment. Can we take the risk with the lives and fate of not only our children, but the children of all the peoples of the world, to say no to a technological option that radically reduces 
carbon dioxide. We know very clearly what the consequences of going ahead with the current pattern of development here and around the world is likely to be. If we build all those coal plants that we're now planning to build around the United States and in China and in India, we are going to find a world that we do not like very much. It will not be a question of economic choice. It will be a question of war and peace. It will be a fight over water. It will be a fight over air. It will be a fight over land. It will be a fight over food. This is a question of war and peace. It is not a question of economics. And if we fail to deter the rise of CO2 in a radical way, radically reduce that CO2, uh, CO2 emissions, we will find ourselves in a world of conflict, in a world of disorder, and a world that our children will curse us for. And if we make the choices today right to give ourselves choices in the future, if we have options in energy, in a decade, in 20 years' time. If we can do it without CO2, we're going to create a world for our children where they have choices, they have room to maneuver, and they can make still better choices beyond that. Thank you. Please join me in thanking both Peter and Ralph.